Hello again, and welcome to First Christian Reformed Church of Montreal. I'd like to welcome everyone who's listening and watching online, and especially if you're joining us for the first time, thanks for being with us. If you'd like to find out more about us at First CRC, you can check out our website. It's at www.montrealcrc.org, and you can also visit us on Facebook. We begin our worship today with a couple of suggested songs, By Faith and If Thou But Trust in God to Guide Thee. If you look in the description below this video, you'll find links there to other YouTube videos that include words and music for each of these songs if you'd like to listen or even sing along. Our call to worship for today is based on Psalm 27 and John chapter 4. Let us worship God, our light and our salvation. The Lord is the stronghold of our lives. We desire to live in God's house and to seek God in his holy temple. We have come with shouts of joy to sing and to make music to the Lord. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Teach us your ways and make straight our paths in this hour of worship and always. Our God himself greets us this morning with these words taken from Isaiah 42. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. Amen. The psalmist models a transparent faith with these words. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. We express our longing for God's leading by our own transparent confession. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. God of all nations, we praise you that in Christ the barriers that have separated humanity are torn down. Yet we confess our slowness to open our hearts and minds to people of other lands, tongues, and races. Deliver us from the sins of fear and prejudice, that we may move toward the day when all are truly one in Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is our peace. Those who are divided, he has made one. He has broken down the barriers of separation by his death and has built us up into one body with God. To all who repent and believe, he has promised reconciliation. So live as people reconciled. And all God's people said, Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from Luke chapter 10. The Gospel of Luke chapter 10 verses 38 to 42. Before we read these words together, let us again come before God in prayer. Lord, where shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Help us now to hear and obey what you say to us today. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't know if anything ever came of it, but I remember seeing an article in the news a few years ago saying that Martha Stewart had a new reality show in the works. The new show was going to be called Help Me Martha. Now, the premise of this new show was that people could get in touch with Martha Stewart, the domestic diva herself. People could get in touch with her and have her come and help a friend who's struggling to put together the perfect wedding or who can't figure out how to prepare a proper Thanksgiving dinner, things like that. Now, like I said, I'm not sure that anything ever came of the idea. I don't remember hearing anything else about it. But if Martha's idea for this new TV show had ever become a reality, I'm sure there would have been lots of people out there who, who would have gone for it. Because really, really, who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't welcome the opportunity to have America's ultimate expert on all things having to do with decorating, dining, and good manners right there, helping you avoid domestic disaster by picking out just the right silverware or planning your next soiree? I'm sure at least a few of us could use that. Mind you, I'm not so sure what Martha Stewart could have done to help with the dinner party that we read about in Luke chapter 10. There was already a Martha there. And from what we're told in Luke and in the Gospel of John, this Martha was already quite a capable hostess in her own right. Luke doesn't tell us specifically that Martha owned the house where she and Mary lived with their brother Lazarus although it's possible that she did. She may have been a sharp businesswoman, or it could be that she was a wealthy widow. It may be that she was one of the well-to-do women who were told helped support Jesus financially throughout his ministry. Whatever the case may have been, you still get the distinct impression that this is Martha's home. She's the one who invited Jesus and his disciples to stay. She's the one who welcomes them. She's the one who takes on the role of gracious hostess. Of course, it doesn't look like Martha's doing as well as her more modern namesake at playing the role of domestic diva. Things are not going well. The bread's not rising the way it's supposed to. One of the silver dessert spoons is missing. Then this happens, and then that before you know it, it's not just the gravy that's about to boil over in Martha's kitchen. Now, we also need to remember that hosting a dinner party back then in the first century AD, that was a whole lot more involved than anything Martha Stewart would pull off today. You didn't just go to Metro or Sobeys and pick up a nice roast or a Cornish game hen. You couldn't, because there weren't any supermarkets. If you wanted meat... You had to round up the animal and, and basically butcher it yourself. And everything else had to be done at home by hand the hard way. Everything from fetching water from the well to, to chopping kindling for the oven so that you could bake the bread. Everything. And to be fair to Martha, you could also argue that her sister Mary is being a bit of a slacker. Even though there's still work to be done, Mary decides to sneak off and sit at Jesus' feet. And it's actually kind of amazing that Jesus even lets her get away with it. Rabbis normally did not associate with women, and they certainly didn't take on women as disciples. Back then, everyone knew that a, a woman's place was supposed to be in the kitchen, which is exactly what Martha is doing. But that, that's not where Mary is. She's sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his every word. She's claiming a place for herself as one of his disciples. And so, when Martha finally has had enough and she blows up at her sister, it's not too surprising. But that's not all she does. Martha also takes a swipe at Jesus. She says to him, Lord, don't you care? My sister has left me to do all the work by myself. I'm at my wit's end trying to get everything ready here, and there she sits. Tell her to get in here and help me. Come on. Now, of course, it's not that Martha doesn't love Jesus. 
she does truly love him. She wants to do the very best she can for him. But the trouble, the trouble is that she gets so caught up getting everything ready that she forgets the guest. In her book, A Christian View of Hospitality, Michelle Hirschberger points out that Martha was so concerned about the kind of hospitality that she wanted to provide for Jesus that she became inhospitable herself. In her grand moment of welcoming, she became a barrier to that very welcome. That kind of thing happens more often. We want to be hospitable. We want to make people feel welcome when they come into our homes. But we can get so caught up trying to make sure that everything is, is just so. We want our table service to look as meticulous and marvelous as the one on the cover of Good Housekeeping. But in the process, it's easy to forget our guests. Another pastor whose sermons I like reading once wrote about a Christmas gathering he went to where that happened. He and his wife had a wonderful time talking with the other guests. The food was delicious. But they never really got to have any conversation with their hosts. The hosts had gone all out preparing a traditional Christmas dinner. There was duck, stuffing, homemade wine, gravy, jellies, placemats. And they wouldn't let their guests help clean up. But then, by the time they were finished with everything, all the guests had to go home. This pastor and his wife even commented to each other on the way home that, that the meal was wonderful. But they would have rather eaten reheated pizza and actually spent time with their friends instead of just being served by them. That sort of thing can happen in churches too. Sometimes churches can get so busy making sure everything is just right that we forget about our guests. Now, now, I'm not saying that churches don't need to work at being friendly, welcoming, hospitable places. Good programs and good worship services, those things don't just happen. Those things take time. They take talent. But sometimes, sometimes we can get so caught up worrying about our church programs. Do we have the right people in place? Is the material that we're using really the best out there? Or we can get so caught up worrying about our worship services, we want to make sure that everything is absolutely perfect and it just rubs us the wrong way when it's not. We come out of church going, oh, the music was too loud, the minister went too long, the message made no sense. And those things, those things are all important. And we need to always try to offer our best to God. But then what about the guests? What about his guests? What about the people who are, are joining us for the first time or the people who are wondering why they keep showing up? What are we really doing for them? Are we taking time to remember them, to include them, to make sure that this is a good place for them to be as well? But then we need to look back at what happened in Bethany. You look at what happens with Jesus and Mary and Martha. Martha's messed things up. Hospitality in the ancient world was a very serious matter. To neglect a guest was a serious violation of a social code that was considered almost sacred in that time. But Martha, she got, she got so caught up trying to be the perfect host, she got so caught up trying to get everything just right, that she forgot Jesus was her guest. Instead of focusing on him and his needs, things get turned around so that it becomes all about Martha. She's the one saying, don't you care, Jesus, about me? Look, look at everything I'm doing. Tell my sister to help me. But you'll notice, you'll notice that Jesus never criticizes Martha for this grievous breach of etiquette. He doesn't snap back at her and say, well, the trouble is, Martha, that you're just way too busy to notice anybody else but yourself. And you'll notice, too, Jesus doesn't criticize Martha for being busy. That's not the real issue as far as he's concerned. The issue is, is whether you're busy for the right reasons. When you take a look back at a, a few verses earlier in Luke chapter 10, you see there the parable of the Good Samaritan, and, and there's lots of busy people in that story too. 
You have the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan. They're all busy. They're all out doing things for the Lord. But only one of them, only one of them is held up as a good example. Only one of them, the Samaritan, is busy for the right reasons. Jesus never criticizes or condemns Martha for being busy. In fact, Jesus actually steps in and he takes on the role of gracious host himself. Even though technically he is her guest, Jesus extends his hospitality to her. He says to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried, but you don't need to be. You're upset about so many things, all those details. It's wonderful. It's good. But it's not necessary. Only one thing really matters. Look at Mary. Look at your sister. She has chosen something better. And it won't ever be taken from her. Even though he's Martha's guest, Jesus turns things around. He invites her to sit down and join Mary. Jesus invites Martha to receive him and to hear what he has to say. He invites Martha to listen and learn from the one who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This story about Martha and Mary It's not in the Bible just to teach us that there are two ways to live as Christians, one better, one worse. Jesus isn't saying here that it's better to to sit and contemplate and meditate all day than it is to be out there busy doing stuff for him and for the church, for the kingdom. Jesus himself came as a servant. He came to serve us, even though even though we should have received him, we should have honored him as our guest. And of course, we know what happened instead. When Jesus was born, there was no room at the inn. When he grew up, he had no place to lay his head. When he finally came and presented himself as king, he was arrested and crucified. But what gets highlighted in the story of Martha and Mary is how, despite our repeated failures to receive Jesus with anything remotely resembling a proper welcome, despite all that, he still steps in and he takes on the role of gracious host himself. In Jesus, God himself extends his hospitality to us. By sending his Son to us to seek and save the lost, God invites wandering sinners to come home. Because his Son was willing to take our place on the cross and suffer the punishment that we deserved, God made it possible for us to come to him and call him Father and enter into his rest, to enter into his kingdom. But the thing is, as Michelle Hirschberger points out, If we want to extend that same kind of hospitality to others, if we want others to also experience something of God's hospitality, we must first experience God's hospitality ourselves. Our service matters to God, but if if it is grounded in anything other than a transformative experience with God, it is unacceptable. Mr. Tamrat Lane underwent a transforming experience like that. His story was featured in an article in our church magazine, The Banner, a few years ago. Mr. Tamrat had spent 15 years of his life hiding in the mountains of Ethiopia. At that time, he was a communist revolutionary hoping to overthrow the corrupt regime that ruled his country. He finally got his wish in 1991 when he became prime minister. But then... Mr. Tamrat's motto at the time was, Freedom comes out of the barrel of a gun. But then, a few years later, in 1996, Tamrat was arrested, imprisoned on corruption charges. He was locked away in solitary confinement. He went from being the most powerful man in his country to becoming a miserable outcast. But then, while he was in prison, Tamrat Lane experienced for himself something of God's great hospitality. A nurse gave him a pocket Bible, and as he read through it, something unexpected happened. 
According to Tamrat himself, Jesus found me. Tamrat was released in 2008. He then moved with his family to the U.S., but his plan was to eventually go back to East Africa, but this time as a guest, as a missionary. And his slogan had changed. Tamrat Lane was no longer telling people that freedom comes out of the barrel of a gun. Instead, he had started telling people, freedom comes through the gospel. That's the kind of thing that happens when we receive Christ as guest. God comes and he turns things around and he welcomes us into his family. He welcomes us into his kingdom. And it's only when we receive God's hospitality, it's only when we receive what God has to offer us, his word, his spirit, his love, it's only then that we are really ready to receive others. If anyone who's listening or was watching this message has not experienced that, I hope you do soon, maybe even today. Because it's only when we realize that we really are God's guests, that he really is the host who has already welcomed us in while we were still strangers. It's only then that we are ready to start serving him. Amen. As we continue our worship together, let's spend a few moments in silent reflection. We again have a few questions to help guide your thoughts. Do you ever find that church life or your own personal life is so busy that there isn't time to welcome someone new? What could you possibly do about that? How have you experienced God's hospitality? What difference has that made in your life? Let's take a few moments now to come to God in a time of prayer for the needs of our church family, our community, and the world around us. We will be concluding our time of prayer by reciting the Lord's Prayer together. Lord God, Father in heaven, sometimes it's not easy for us to welcome others. It's not always easy for us to receive other people as guests. We worry, like Martha did, about all the work and the preparation involved. And it's hard, too, to reach out to people that we don't know very well, to strangers. It can be a risky business. And yet you are the one, God, you are the one who reached out to us when we were far away. We were estranged from you, and yet you came to us. You sent us your own son, Jesus, and even though we didn't welcome him, through his death and his resurrection, you have caught us up again into your loving arms. Lord, we ask that you help us to be a community that welcomes others as you do. Help us to be a community that practices hospitality. Especially right now when we've been told again and again how important it is to, to practice physical distancing and social isol isolation. Showing hospitality has gotten a whole lot more complicated. And after watching the news this past week, we've been reminded again that as much as we'd like to think that, that we've got a handle on prom problems like racism and discrimination, we still keep failing and falling short. But help us, Father. Help us to see this time as an opportunity to hit the reset button, so to speak. Help us to see this time as an opportunity to try again to make the most of the new beginning that you have given us in Jesus Christ. Grip our hearts again with that amazing truth of how you, the Lord of creation, the maker of heaven and earth, you were willing to come and live among us as a guest. But that, that is exactly what happened when you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to live among us. And even though, even though we didn't recognize him, even though we didn't treat him as a king, it is through him that we have been welcomed into your presence. We have been welcomed into your kingdom. May those of us who've experienced your great hospitality, may we be ready to go out and invite others in. Because of how your son came to serve us, help us to be willing to serve others. All this we pray in Jesus' precious name.
the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Giving is part of our worship. It's part of how we show the love of God by reaching out to other people. Now, if you are just joining us online, there is no expectation that you have to give anything. But if you are part of the church family at First CRC, this is a way that we can give thanks to God and help in the work of His church. Our offerings this week are for our own ministries here at First CRC and for Mission Montreal, which is a collaborative effort of Resonate Global Mission, Diaconal Ministries Canada, Classis Eastern Canada, Christian Direction, and First CRC. For more information on how to give, especially if you want to give online, you can contact us by going to our church website or by visiting our Facebook page. God calls us to again live for Him. The light of God's purposes has shone upon us. Carry that light into another week. The star of God's promises that led us to worship now leads us to serve in God's world. When we have met God in the light, we cannot dwell comfortably in the shadows. We cannot enjoy our abundance and wealth without thanksgiving and generous sharing. The glory of God shines on you today. Others will see your radiance and rejoice with you. We seek God's peace that we may share it, God's wisdom that we may live by it, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The God who has welcomed us as his people, his children, sends us out to welcome others with his blessing resting upon us. The grace of Christ attend you. The love of God surround you. The Holy Spirit keep you now and forevermore. Amen. As we finish our time of worship today, we have a couple of more suggested songs. Have thine own way, Lord, and your grace is enough. Again, if you look at the description below this video, there you will find links to other YouTube videos, including words and music for each of these songs. Until next time, God bless. <laughs>